Madam President, I was grateful for the opportunity, like I'm sure we all were, to be back home for the last two weeks for the state work period and to talk to our constituents. Uh, some of my conversations, and I suspect I'm not alone, uh, some of these conversations were virtual, but most, uh, most of us are glad to get back to uh, whatever the next normal is and have more and more human interaction rather than the isolation and, frankly, some of the anxiety that comes along with being kept apart. Uh, we're uh, social animals, we human beings, and we uh, thrive on and we, I believe, need that kind of interaction. But so far this year, most, most of it has been virtual. I did have a chance to speak to the Texas Hispanic Chamber members and the members of the U.S. Hispanic Chamber as part of their annual legislative summit. Um, like many of uh, the folks who do fly-ins at least once a year, um, we've had to forego that, so this was a virtual meeting. But I did get a chance to hear from many of the members, and their, particularly their board members, on the importance of our response to the pandemic and the progress that they have in turn been able to make through things like the Paycheck Protection Program. I also was able to join friends with the Web, from Webb County, that's Laredo, Texas, at the North American Development Bank and their private partners to announce a $216 million investment in a new solar farm, which they are very excited about. And I was glad to be able to visit with a number of Texans in person with all of the appropriate safety precautions that we've all learned so well. I was able to kick off the National Volunteer Month at the San Antonio Food Bank with a number of incredible nonprofits and people with big hearts who are volunteering even amidst the, hopefully, the waning days of this pandemic at the food bank. I hope Texans and folks all across the country will continue to find ways to support one another by volunteering with local nonprofits this month and into the future. I also was able to meet with uh, venue owners and operators at Antone's in Austin, which is the live music capital of the world. On the day before applications opened for the U.S. Small Business Administration Shuttered Venue Operators Grant, this uh, grant program was established through the Save Our Stages Act, which Senator Klobuchar and I introduced and which was signed into law as part of the December relief bill. These small venues were excluded from the Paycheck Protection Program and, of course, were among the first to close and will be among the last to open. But what we did in the Save Our Stages Act will go a long way to ensure that the marquees at our most beloved live entertainment venues can shine bright once again. And I'm eager for the funds to reach Texas venues. Then in Dallas, I was I joined my friend Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson to announce bipartisan legislation we're introducing in response to the deadly winter storm that hit Texas last February. This legislation will help build resilience in our electrical infrastructure uh, throughout the country and will help ensure we're better prepared for whatever extreme weather Mother Nature sends our way. It was great, as I said, to visit with folks in person again and I'm glad to see a, gra a gradual return to our new normal as more and more Americans are vaccinated. Even though the issues I'm, I was discussing throughout my state were different, one common theme that I brought up everywhere I went was to continue to encourage Texans to get vaccinated. So far, nine million of us have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 5.6 million Texans are fully vaccinated. Obviously, we're not out of the woods yet, but Americans have every reason to be optimistic about the headway made in the fight against COVID-19. Unfortunately, just as we're seeing progress on the pandemic, we're seeing another crisis on our border. In February, Customs and Border Protection encountered more than 100,000 migrants along our southern border, the highest total since 2006. Last month, things continued to trend in the wrong direction. CBP encountered more than 172,000 migrants along our border, which is the highest in two decades. Put simply, our immigration system cannot accommodate 
this many migrants coming at one time. We lack the personnel, the facilities, the resources, and the policies to efficiently process these migrants to make sure those with valid claims safe for asylum are protected and to provide quality care to all of those in our custody in the meantime. That's true for adults and family units, but especially for the alarming number of unaccompanied children. In the summer of 2014, we saw a similar spike in children arriving at our border, which President Obama called a humanitarian crisis. It absolutely was. Between October 2013 and September 2014, more than 68,500 unaccompanied children entered the United States. We're only halfway through fiscal year 2021 and are already reaching that total, with more than 48,500 migrant children having crossed our border just in the last six months. Nearly 19,000 of these children came last month alone, the highest monthly total on record. Putting that in perspective, almost 19,000 children in, in one month. That's roughly enough to fill every seat in the AT&T Center in San Antonio where the San Antonio Spurs play. There are grave, cascading consequences to this flow of humanity coming across our border. It obviously impacts these children, as well as the communities and organizations that care for them, and of course, the criminal organizations that smuggle people into the country, along with illicit drugs, they're getting richer in the, in the process. Over the last several weeks, I've spent time in these communities that are managing this crisis to learn more about the challenges that they face. Last month, my friend Henry Cuellar, Congressman from Laredo, Texas, and I visited the Creso Springs Influx Care Facility, which is one of the shelters that houses young boys aged 13 through 17. We heard from the men and women who run the shelter, as well as stakeholders in Laredo, elected officials and others, NGO representatives. We heard from them about the mounting challenges of this crisis. I visited three additional facilities in Midland, Dallas, and Houston during this last work period, and I saw the incredible ways that these communities and the non-governmental associations are caring for migrant children. Let me just say, Madam President, we all recognize our obligation to treat these children and these migrants humanely while they are here in our country. But we also need to make sure that our laws are equally enforced on a fair basis and that people who come this way don't jump ahead of people who are who have been waiting patiently in line to come into the United States through legal means. Just before the state uh, work period started, Senator Cruz and I hosted 17 of our fellow Republican colleagues in the Senate down in the Rio Grande Valley. And I was pleased when I heard uh, from my friend Henry Cuellar again that he had hosted uh, Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia, and John Hickenlooper, the, the senator from Colorado. I'm glad that members of both parties are coming down to learn from themselves and listen to the same experts that I depend on to give me good information. We saw the facility in Donna where many of these children were first processed and learned about the challenges created by such a high volume of unaccompanied children. For folks that don't live in a border state or haven't spent much time in our border communities, it's important to see the situation firsthand and to learn from those experts I mentioned a moment ago. I've worked with folks in the Rio Grande Valley throughout my time in, this, in the Senate to ensure that these communities are safe, prosperous, and vibrant places to live. These men and women have valuable insight for all of us into the policies that have led to this crisis and the ones we need to put in place to turn things around. I appreciate these experts who spent time sharing their feedback with all of us who have been interested enough to travel to the border and the colleagues who visited there. I'm glad our colleagues were able to see and learn more about the unique challenges facing these communities and our nation when it comes to uncontrolled, overwhelming masses of humanity. To read news stories about the thousands of children that are brought to the United States alone is heartbreaking. To see their faces, though, and learn more about the devastating circumstances in which they were brought here is also nothing short of heartbreaking. 
at the K. Bailey Hutchison Convention Center in Dallas, which is now serving as a shelter for 2,300 young boys, I heard from one young boy who arrived in the United States after a three-month trek from Central America on foot. He told us he spent time hiding in jungles along the way and that food was scarce through much of their journey. As you can imagine, he was happy to be in a safe shelter receiving three square meals a day. He was understandably soft-spoken about his long and treacherous journey, and I'm sure he experienced hardships that you and I could hardly imagine, certainly circumstances we would never want our children or grandchildren to experience. Last week, some truly disturbing allegations came out about abuse in one of the temporary facilities in San Antonio. As I said, these children have arrived in our country after a perilous journey. Many arrived sick, malnourished, and having endured abuse, including assault, along the way. The fact that any of these forms of abuse could continue while in the care of the United States government is despicable. I've called on the Inspector General of, of Health and Human Services to fully investigate these allegations of sexual assault in this facility at the Joe Freeman Coliseum. I hope the administration will support our efforts to get to the bottom of what happened and ensure that no child is ever subjected to any level of mistreatment while in our care. The real kicker in all of this is that as all of this is unfolding, the coyotes, the smugglers, and the cartels that bring these children to our border are getting richer and richer and richer. Border Patrol said it's common for families to pay thousands of dollars to the coyotes to bring children to America. With nearly 19,000 caught last month alone, it's easy to see how profitable this business is. Let's say the cartels charge $5,000 a head, a low estimate based on some of the figures I've seen. That would mean these criminals brought in nearly $100 million in revenue in March alone just from smuggling children. These cartels, these transnational criminal organizations, tactics include dropping children as young as three years old over the top of a 14-foot segment of the border wall or allowing a six-month-old child to be thrown from a raft into the Rio Grande River to divert Border Patrol while they attempt a rescue so they can get on their way. This has to stop, Madam President. We can get into an argument about who's to blame, but that doesn't change the more, more important matter about who has the power to stop it. First, President Biden needs to acknowledge the scope of this crisis and commit to addressing it along with us in the Congress. All we've gotten from the White House so far are statements telling migrants now is not the time to come, as though they will let everyone know when the time to come is appropriate. Two and a half weeks ago, the President tapped Vice President Harris to lead efforts to address this crisis, and I thought this was a sign that the administration was finally ready to take some informed action. But the Vice President hasn't made a single trip to the border yet, and there's not even one on the horizon. And then she seemed to walk back that no, her assignment wasn't at the border, it was to engage in diplomacy with countries in Central America. Simple statements urging people not to come are meaningless when all of the policies represent a flashing green light. That's especially true when Central Americans hear messages from their family and friends who've made it to America that the door is wide open and they will be let in. The administration must take action and implement policies that discourage parents from sending their children on this very perilous and dangerous journey in the hands of human smugglers and criminals into the United States. And we have a big role to play too, Madam President. Immigration reform has been one of my greatest frustrations throughout my time here. Previous attempts to make lasting changes led to bills that were so big that they crumbled under their own weight. I hope we can all agree that this is not the time to repeat that history. We need to take action to address the crisis at hand now without extraneous matters that could be and should be made, taken uh, changes made down the line. I'm working with some of our Democratic colleagues to achieve this in, and I'm eager to share more details soon. Republicans and Democrats must work together to address this crisis. 
and to bring order out of chaos and to protect the innocent children who are being harmed. Legal immigration has been one of the, one of the cornerstones of our great country throughout our history. Legal immigration is generous, it's safe, it's orderly, and it's fair. Illegal immigration and the horrors that it brings along with it, some of which we learned about on our recent trips to the, to the border, are not humane. They, are, they dishonor the willingness of people who want the country legally to wait patiently in line by jumping ahead of them in line. But as I say, the cartels and human smugglers know our laws and our vulnerabilities better than we do, and they're exploiting it each and every day. And we've got to bring it to an end. Madam President, I yield the floor.